let's do it because it's a big it's a big thing that that you got this week it's a big victory i don't want to oversell it but i think you're going to explain why it's such a big victory but before we get there people have asked for a very brief synopsis of amos miller's crisis so that people can understand what the hell is going on and where he's at now all i could start by summarizing it but i don't want to really screw things up suffice to say he was targeted at first by the was it at first by the FDA and then by the Pennsylvania PDA the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture for allegedly selling raw milk or unpasteurized milk they say you're selling stuff without a seal of approval uh, they then go in and seize all you know seize his food material say he can't sell it to his customers uh, give it a summary so that it will be the intro for those who don't know what's going on yet yeah people want uh, the links to the court documents links to other media interviews about this case links to other uh, news site coverage of the case uh, a basic description of the Amos Miller case. We have all of that at 1776lawcenter.com. Uh, unlike the Trump campaign, unlike Candace Owens, we don't send out five solicitations every day uh, for, for money. Instead, we provide things of value, like the Vegas 50th birthday party coming up uh, that people, there's still tickets available uh, for. We were able to give some away because people bought tickets for other people to go, which is great. Uh, from the Viva Barnes Law dot locals dot com board, uh, and uh, you know there's merch and cool fun stuff that you can join in to support and broadcast support for Amos Miller. The Amos Miller case. Amos Miller is an Amish farmer, fifth generation Amish farmer, from Lancaster County, dairy country in Pennsylvania, the heart of the uh, of the Amish in America. The Amish have a unique and distinct religious uh, beliefs that carry over into their lifestyle. This goes back centuries. Uh, movies like Witness partially portray it in the mid-1980s. Uh, probably the best popular depiction of it. But the Amish are very unique in modern society, especially because they don't use modern technology. So they've opted out of the big tech world. Uh, they don't follow modern media. They don't watch TV shows. They don't watch modern films. They don't, they're not part of modern gaming culture. So they've opted out of big Hollywood. The, they, uh, te they teach and educate their own children. They went, several of them, including Amos Miller's grandfather, went to jail over the right to educate their own children and not have a state monopoly over the education of their children. They ultimately won that right before the Supreme Court of the United States in a famous case called Yoder. The, uh, so they've opted out of big education. They uh, have always uh, considered uh, health and medicine uh, to be ideally done in a natural, beneficial way in lifestyle. So they have mostly opted out of big pharma. And last but not least, they've opted out of big food. They farm their own food. They're very proud. They're great carpenters, and they're very and they're excellent, superb farmers. And they use traditional organic methods. They avoid lots of chemicals. They avoid lots of additives. They don't lace their food products with a bunch of uh, cre uh, something created out of a lab. That's the, they make food the way our founders ate their food and made their food. Uh, so the milk is unpasteurized, so-called raw milk. It's really fresh milk, true milk, cow's milk. Uh, they, uh, and they make a whole bunch of products from that milk that's not pasteurized or chemically altered or uh, burns out all of the good and healthy bacteria that's otherwise in there. They, uh, they do, and they make meat in the same way. They make uh, poultry, like their chicken or free range. That if you, you couldn't have a greater contrast between an Amish farm and America's corporate farming system. And I'll, I'll bring something up real quick. I brought it up before, but you know, there's a, people tend to think that the Amish suffer from certain diseases much less than the broader American population. And even according to this fact check, it's true. But in order to be the fact checking losers that they are, they have to make an absolute statement that no one's making. No Amish kids aren't immune to cancer, diabetes, and autism, and they aren't vaccine free either. Nobody says that. Bottom line, even in this Associated Press fact check, it shows lower cancer rates, lower diabetes rates, lower autism rates, and they may not be vaccine free, but they are certainly lower in vaccines than the broader American population. So it, it, it's, it's demonstrably true that they live longer, don't suffer from diseases that the broader American population suffers from. And you can find, you can attribute that to whatever cause you want, but the fact checkers refuse to accept it. So they make a straw man fact check to fact check and debunk. Sorry. Carry on. Yeah, the other things they have much lower rates of is much lower rates of social discord, 
much lower rates of violence, much lower rates of crime, much lower rates of mental health problems, much, much lower rates of anxiety, much lower rates of depression, much lower rates of self-harm. In other words, by pretty much every objective metric of what we consider happiness and a good life, the Amish are some of the happiest and best lived people in the world. And so they provide a control group alternative that says, what if we lived life free of big tech, free of big pharma, free of big food, free of big media? What would our life look like? Well, it might look a lot like the Amish. And anybody who studies them or gets to know them thinks that's a lot better way to live. And that presents a threat, an existential threat to the Bill Gateses of the world. There's not a coincidence that this Bond-like villain is involved in all four of those areas. Comes from big tech, major investments in big pharma, major investments in big food, including buying up farmland all across America to do what? to make that farmland useless because his big thing is producing chemical lab-created meat, fake meat, beyond meat, i.e. I, I, not meat is how it should be marketed or advertised, and big involvement in big media and the big educational systems. So the Amish show us the problems with the Bill Gates utopian world as the dystopian environment it really predicts and foretells. And so in that context, you have a simple farmer fifth generation Amish farmer, making food the way his father did, his grandfather did, his great granddaddy did, and his great great granddaddy did. And he's just making food that's so extraordinary. He's built up a deeply loyal customer base uh, that is to have become members of his private organization. He doesn't sell to the public. He doesn't sell commercially. You can't find his food at a retail store or even a farmer's market. It's only available to people who join his Amos Miller's Organic Farm Unincorporated Private Association. But the reason why they join it is as they have testified to in the hundreds under penalty of perjury before court is that Amos Miller's food is the best food they've ever had. That Amos Miller's food was the only food they could find that could successfully deal with their medical conditions or the medical conditions of their children and their loved ones. That was critical to their religious and political beliefs and, and expressive and associative characteristics of being part of this Amish exit ramp from big pharma, big food controlled uh, food supply. And now, but th so then what happens? Because at some point, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture comes in and says, sorry, uh, Mr. Miller, you're selling unlicensed or uncertified food that didn't go through the PDA approval process and we're shutting you down. Well, essentially, he poses an, an existential threat, his success. As more and more people try to pursue the Amish exit ramp from big food control. And for those that don't know, we went from 90% of our food being produced and eaten directly from the producer uh, at the time of our founding to now 98% of our food comes from corporate-owned agricultural facilities. 90% of our cheese has... Pfizer infected components in it. I mean, that's that's how people don't know how our food has become completely corporatized and commercialized and industrialized. And those companies have monopolized that food space by what means? By their, their collusion with state and federal regulators who have used their power to suppress independent small farmers to try to wipe them out. In Lancaster County, as an example, heart of dairy country, arguably in America, almost half of dairy farmers have either quit in the last 10 years or say they will quit in the next 10 years. They are wiping out small independent farmers in America. And let's remember, independent of the food debate, small farmers, as Thomas Jefferson noted, were the foundation of human constitutional democracy in a republic. They were the basis along with the working men for Andrew Jackson's populist revolution and rebellion. Free soil, free labor was really the political animation behind the movement for abolition of slavery in America. They have been the foundation of our core liberties and the self-sufficiency they provide, the exit ramp from big food controlled society they provide, 
presents an imminent risk to the big corporations who monopolize the food supply. And they want to use their collusive relationship with the regulators to suppress them. So what happened is almost a decade ago, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture in secret began to surveil Amos Miller, who's the kind of guy you can just walk up to at the farm and say hi to. He'll, he'll, he'll greet you there. Amos Miller's business model was that of a local farm. And when did it become a subscription based system where he would he would send his product out to, to out of staters? For, for almost the entire time, because it was his understanding that this was not a commercial sale within the meaning of the law, as long as the private members associated together to uh, to make sure they could get the safe, healthy food that they wanted. So he's been active for almost 20 years, but about midway through, he's becoming incredibly successful from a perspective of an Amish farmer having tens of thousands of people who've had his food products at some point over that time period. And, and terrified the corporate is a big food establishment. And, uh, and so they called on their collusive relationship, corrupt relationship with, the, with big agriculture, with the big regulators. And the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture starts to secretly surveil Amos Miller and want to go after him. But they have a problem, the limits of the law. The law only is governed commercial sales to Pennsylvania customers. That's the state law limitation. The federal law from 1905 to 1967 explicitly said all of our food, federal food laws said this doesn't apply to food you buy directly from the producer. It doesn't apply to the small farmer, has no application, none of it. In 1967, they decide to expand that by creating a custom licensed exception from all the licensure and regulatory requirements. But then the USDA and the FDA decide they're going to misinterpret that to radically restrict who suddenly has access to farmer food. So, you, so the feds have their own legal issues with how broad they're defining the law, and the state has their own issues. So what the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture does is they refer the case in secret to the Food and Drug Administration and say, please go after this little Amish farmer, even though the, they admitted on the stand that at that point, and to this day, over 20 years, Amos Miller produced millions of food products to tens of thousands of Americans, and there has been not one single complaint anywhere in the country in 20 years. You're talking about the best customer satisfaction safety record of any farmer in America. So, so PDA, Pennsylvania Department of Ag Agriculture, tries to collude with the Food and Drug Administration to say, go after Amos Miller. The FDA, from what I recall, does take proactive measures, but ultimately backs off and says, we're not going to get involved. Yeah, well, here's why. Around the same time, the FDA had, was waging a war on unpasteurized milk. This goes all the way back to the mid 80s, early 90s. The state of California did the same thing. They put the Altadena dairy far farming family, the Stuvey family, out of business. I represented them years later in separate litigation involving uh, things like the case we'll talk about a little bit later, legal theories of intended duties to third-party beneficiaries. But, the, but what happened was more and more Americans were waking up. If they got access to natural organic food, not the fake organic food that the FDA and USDA calls organic, and it really isn't, uh, real uh, uh, food, the best made in the world, frankly. Uh, I've eaten at the best restaurants in the world, according to Michelin star ratings. The best meal I have ever had has been at Amos Miller's dinner table because it is fresh from beginning to end. They farm, I mean, the, the peas they make, everything, the, the bread they make, dessert, I mean, all of it from scratch is real is made right there. It's like having dinner the way your, you know, your, your grandparents would talk about having it at their grandparents. And it's extraordinary. So people introduced it. Like first time I had unpasteurized milk was at a Stuvie family farm up in California. And I was like, holy cow. Well, in fact, people noticed I had ordered some of Amos's milk uh, and was drinking it. And it's like, is Barnes on cocaine? The, uh, I mean, he's got all this energy, all this excitement, all this enthusiasm. Uh, that, that, that milk was amazing in its benefits. And this is what people have lived, their lived experience. People were willing to risk being targeted by state and federal agencies to testify under penalty of perjury on Amos's behalf to the hundreds, hundreds in just days that we were able to gather that many sworn uh, statements under penalty of perjury. Even the judge said, 
had to go out of his way to say, don't interpret anything I ever do as in any way questioning the sincerity of your beliefs that Amos Miller's food is fantastic. But, but, but go before there and we'll, we'll get yeah. to the, get so, to the so, president. So we've got but, extraordinary safe food made in a way that threatens big food. But the FDA has a problem. They want to go after unpasteurized milk. They've been harassing it for years. Amos was going to be one of their potential first test cases. But before that, because of the PDA, but because uh, of the resistance movement, right? You've got this massive movement of more and more people that are like, this food is critical. For some of them, it's they have unique medical conditions that the only means of dealing with it is this unpasteurized milk products. The only means. These are people that have spent years and years and years desperate to find something to treat their condition or their loved one's condition. And they finally find it in Amos Miller's product. People testified to this at the, at the hearing, how you know their, their kid would suffer immediately when they didn't have access to Amos Miller's food product and regress quickly in their physical health and well-being and mental health and well-being, sometimes to the risk of their life. And that's why people traveled up their own penny and neck and dime to be there to testify. So that's the context. Well, the problem with the FDA is Congress has never passed a law prohibiting unpasteurized milk. The FDA made it up themselves, and they did it in violation of the Administrative Procedures Act. So a, a group got together and brought suit and said, if you're going to try to enforce this law anymore against uh, raw milk products, then you're violating the federal law because Congress didn't give you that authority, violate the Administrative Procedures Act and how you passed it. And number two, you're violating our fundamental rights preserved and protected under the Liberty Clause of the United States Constitution, Fifth Amendment against the feds, 14th Amendments against the states. Well, all of a sudden, the FDA realized they were going to lose that lawsuit. So in the middle of this, they step in and say, Judge, Judge, we we're just kidding. We're never going to enforce that law. No, 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 no. You, you don't have to allow the, them to go forward. There, there's no standing because there'll never be any injury. Don't worry. We're not going to enforce it. So that's how they weaseled their way out of that problem. But what that meant was there could be no FDA enforcement of something that's not a real law in the first place so without no them losing in court. And more significantly, if the constitutional right was protected, it would gut 90 percent of what the FDA and all the state regulatory agencies do to small farmers and ordinary consumers every day. Understand this about our food safety laws. All of them are designed to protect and promote the informed consent of the consumer. They are not laws governing producers. They are not laws governing possessors of food. They are not laws there to oppress small farmers. They are there targeting big ag and to make sure big ag isn't lying and deceiving and contaminating and adulterating the products that's sticking on our grocery shelves. But the corrupt regulatory agencies like the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, like the U.S. Department of Agriculture, like the Food and Drug Administration, have, have utilized their power to protect big ag and go after organic food makers, go after the small farmers and strip people of their informed consent by denying them the choice of the food they want and need. So the FDA drops it. PDA goes after Amos Hard. What happened? Well, it was it was a year ago where they, the, he they was refer a second time. So the, the first time so around the where PDA they... first time goes to the FDA. The FDA realizes they're belly up on the law and they don't want to lose. If, if everybody establishes a constitutional right, a fundamental right against it to 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 make informed consent decisions about their own bodies concerning food, then all of a sudden big ag suffers a massive defeat. All the corrupt regulators suffer a massive defeat and they can't interfere with us anymore in our choice of food unless they have a compelling interest with a law that's narrowly tailored. And there's no none of these laws that meet that standard when it comes to this circumstance. So the FDA walks away. PDA doesn't stop, continues to illegally surveil him, continues to uh, in secret monitor him. And then they go to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And they say, go after Amos because of his chickens. Go after him because of his meat. Go after him because of his beef. And what's extraordinary here is, if you go to the kind of food that's approved by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, just go see how the big slaughterhouses handle business. And, and ask yourself, do you consider that sanitary? Uh, go, go look at how the chickens are treated, how the poultry industry has been monopolized by these big 
major conglomerates like the Tyson Foods of the world. Remember, folks, uh, in, in the proverbial words of a Chinese dissident, Tyson Foods is asshole uh, and always will be. Got exposed for it again. But the uh, uh, they have the chicken you eat from the Tyson Foods of the world. Chances are that chicken grew up in a tiny little cage eating other chickens shit. That's what they consider sanitary at the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So the feds go after Amos. Years of going after him. On the verge of bankrupting him, forfeiting his property, taking away his farm, putting him in jail, when you his wife when, on the judgment. When you first took over, he was facing a quarter of a million dollars in fines and potential jail time? Yes. Uh, and facing adding his wife to the judgment and losing the farm. All of it in one clean swoop. Once we get involved, one reason the governments target the Amish is the Amish do not believe in calling public attention to themselves in any way, shape, or form. And the Amish also do not believe in initiating legal action. This means they are very susceptible, vulnerable targets. Because consequently, the government can get away with whatever they want. And the lazy, stupid media in places like Pennsylvania has become stenographers for the corrupt government. I mean, they shouldn't call themselves journalists or reporters. Just call yourself a stenographer. The government blows a leaf across your desk. You sign it and submit it to your editor for publication. They got away with it, uh, particularly in the local Lancaster press, because Amos Miller and the Amish don't seek public attention. They don't do press conferences, won't appear on videos, don't do photographs, uh, and don't bring initial legal action against anyone. But when I got involved, as I, you know, as I said, you know, Jesus may forgive you, uh, but I won't. God may love you, but I don't. Uh, and the Amish may forgive you and love you, but I don't and I won't. Uh, and uh, I, I'm free to do whatever I'm going to do. Uh, you know, Amos may object to it. So I'm still going to do it. Uh, I'm going to seek out the court of public opinion exposing this criminal behavior of our government regulators and agencies. So once I got involved, there was a very smart U.S. attorney on that side of the case who said, ah, let, let, let's resolve all this. Let, let, let's get all this done. Uh, there's no reason to escalate here. Uh, Barnes, uh, let, let, let's all be good. There's plenty of U.S. attorneys uh, and high-ranking government agents that I helped lead to getting jobs in unwelcome places uh, in some past cases that we've done. One, my favorite is one guy got reassigned to Alaska, uh, and it isn't because he likes fishing. Uh, the uh, uh, I, I enjoy every winter knowing he's up there in the dark uh, making his life miserable. Another one was so badly reassigned he quit instead of take the job. But the well, it was a smart prosecutor, recognized their legal risk, recognized their political risk, didn't want to make a martyr of Amos Miller. And so we got pretty quickly a, a full resolution, satisfactory resolution throughout the process. During this time period, the federal judge kept notifying the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and making them agree to these things, saying there's no objection from you, right? There's no objection. You know, there weren't parties to the case formally. You, you, you don't object. I didn't realize why at the time. We hadn't yet done got back our Sunshine Open Records Act request from Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, hadn't yet discovered the secret history of what the PDA was doing in their conspiracy against Amos Miller uh, and Amos Miller's members. The uh, So I didn't know. The judge knew, though. The judge knew these are the corrupt actors dealing with this. So you're going to green light all of this and keep your mouth shut, not complain. And they did. They didn't say boo that entire time period. Then that federal judge dies suddenly, unexpectedly. Within a month, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, recognizing the FDA is not going to take any legal action they have no lawful basis for, recognizing the U.S. Attorney's Office has reached a very satisfactory resolution with Amos and will no longer be harassing him. Then, realizing both of those things, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture starts coordinating with other departments of agriculture across the country to figure out a way to get Amos Miller. In their internal email correspondence, they constantly joke about Amos Miller being handcuffed and dragged off to jail and forfeiting his farm at a foreclosure farm, at a foreclosure sale. Mm -hmm. That's who these people are, including high-ranking lawyers at Penn State University and others who are complicit in this conspiracy. Uh, they should have thought about his members when conspiring in this way. Just because Amos can't sue doesn't mean his members can't. Uh, and that's a little wake-up call that's coming down the road. So what they do is they uh, claim that there's an E. coli outbreak, and we're going to blame Amos Miller's milk. Uh, in mid-December, 
of note, they make no effort to reach out to Amos Miller. Uh, if you if they really thought there was any problem of health problem with his food product, wouldn't you immediately contact the producer of that food to say, hold on, we need to check something? De- December, not to- December 2023? No, December, December 16th. December of 2023. Okay. It's three weeks later they do anything. So that tells you that their motivation is bogus. They know that there was no health problem with Amos Miller's food. In fact, their own testing would later prove it. They wanted to conspire to get Amos Miller, and they knew the best way to do it would be to fabricate a safety crisis around his food and giving how duplicitous and supplicant the Pennsylvania press and political class is to the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and Pope Redding, the Secretary of Agriculture, who must bless your food before you're allowed to eat it, who has his own corrupt ties to big agriculture, by the way. That's something we're further investigating, but it appears Secretary Redding has clear conflicts of interest. He's ma- he's lining his pocket from monies from the c- competitors of Amos Miller. That's what appears to be the case. Uh, we'll, we're further investigating it and figure out uh, the scope of what's taking place there. So they then go get a search warrant based on perjured affidavits. They lie to the judge and tell the judge, oh, there's this big safety risk. And we've been begging Amos to, to take it out licenses and certificates, but he won't do it. He won't help. He won't let us even come and test and sample the food. They're lying to the judge uh, because for they had not reached out at all for years and had voiced no objection at all during all the federal process. They withhold all of that information. They omit all that information. The nitwit perjurer for the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture repeated that perjury by falsifying the evidence in front of the court at a later hearing where she tried to claim that there had been meetings in in the fall of 2023 that Amos had rejected. Even the attorney general had to say, no, no, that that was three years before. Please, please, please. You can't commit that level of perjury. You got to be careful when when you commit perjury here. Uh, So the, the, the judge just signs off on it, the magistrate, not knowing they've been lied to. They come and do a massive raid of his facility. They lock everybody out. They block out the independent press. They block out Amos Miller. That, too, they will lie about later on at the hearing. They will take selective photographs while suppressing the body camera footage in order to try to falsely claim there's some issue with sanitary conditions by falsifying the photography at a later hearing. But they don't actually allege any sanitary problem at all, just like the feds never alleged a single sanitary problem in decades and years of inspections and surprise search warrants and raids at his facility and at his farm. Anybody that's been there knows how clean it is. So the uh, so the nature of it is, is that's how they do it. They go in and detain his food. They order him. He, he's not allowed to sell his food. He's not allowed to distribute his food. He's not allowed to give away his food. He's not even allowed to feed himself or his own family with his own farmed food. That, and that was the injunction that they got, which was ratified whole, by and large um, the last time we did the update about this. W- yeah, with, so what uh, happens is that gets issued. They then issue an order of destruction, ordering that food. that They, they conduct a bunch of tests. And guess what? There's no E. coli in any of his food. There's no E. coli in any of the environmental samples. There's no e-, e. coli in any of the water. There's no E. coli anywhere. They can't find any E. coli. They were trying to blame him for E. coli problems, and it turned out there they was none, none. Not only that, it turned out the people that claimed got really sick from E. coli didn't actually get really sick from E. coli. They had no favorable testimony at all. They had none, no safety evidence at all. They had accused him falsely eight years before of a uh, listeria illness, and it turned out we got evidence of access to the records and database And that person had listeria six months before they were ever even near any food product of Amos Miller. They knew that was fabricated for nearly a decade, submitted perjured affidavits on that basis before the courts. So the uh, but despite all that, despite the clean food test, they find microscopic aspects of listeria in a small sample of products of other farmers food simply being stored at Amos Miller's freezer. And they use that to claim, oh, we've got to shut him down completely. We do the detailed review and discovers there is no risk. We isolate where the listeria came from. None of it came from any of his stuff. And it wasn't serious enough to be a health risk, according to standards that even communists in Canada and Europe admit is not a health risk. And they love their regulations there. And so the based on that, we have a hearing. And at that evidentiary hearing, one of the leading experts in the country 
who worked for a decade and a half on these issues at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, doesn't testify for the government, testifies for Amos Miller, says his food product is extraordinarily safe. That in her review of all the testing, her review of all the data, her review of, of all the conditions and safety record of the farm, conclude her to believe that his food product is completely safe. Not only that, heart doctors testify on behalf of Amos Miller's food. One of the leading food advocates in the country, uh, 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 Sally at Weston Price, she testifies on behalf of Amos Miller. And then all hundreds of actual customers testify on behalf of Amos Miller. And all the government has is their low IQ lard asses who are physical examples of why you shouldn't eat what the PDA approves, uh, lying and perjuring themselves on the stand. At the conclusion of that hearing, the judge drastically limits the injunction. It, there's no injunction on possessing food, no injunction on producing food, no injunction on distributing food, no injunction on non-commercial use of food, no injunction on personal use of the food. It was so severe, the state of Pennsylvania was actually requiring that uh, uh, Amos Miller uh, ration what food he could feed his own family, rationing a farmer's food to his own family. That's how nuts the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture is. And so the only thing the judge did is say you can't market and sell certain raw milk products. Uh, uh, it, it, that's it. No other uh, provisions of the injunction. We request the judge modify it. Our request is judge that there should be a third condition there. That if there's a sale and marketing of raw milk products within so the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, because that's what the law says. And the this goes this goes to the interstate commerce rule where that you can't prevent someone from one state selling to another state because that is a state exceeding its constitutional limits of power. Exactly. And, and the judge said over and over again, I'm not here to amend the law. He was clearly moved by the testimony of all the individuals, saw the state didn't have a credible safety claim, was clearly agitated about things like, so we're really only here because he doesn't have a permit. That's the only reason we're here, because you, you want me to enjoin him and prohibit him from doing something because of a permit that I mean, I mean he, and he wanted the state to reconsider their position, but they refused. And he said, look, I think that, you know, the this the, you know, maybe this is a bad law, but I interpret that I'm just here to enforce the law, not here to write the law. And so I said, you know, I feel stuck in how, how I do it. So that's how he, why he ruled the way he did. But he made clear he wasn't going to write the law and he wasn't going to amend the law. And so our position was we came in and said, hey, judge, uh, here's what the law says. The law says this only applies within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. That's what the state legislature of Pennsylvania has decided. All of its food safety laws only protect Pennsylvania con customers, Pennsylvania consumers, Pennsylvania residents within the state of Pennsylvania. That's it. Because that, remember, that's what all of our food safety laws were sold as. They were never sold as farmer control laws. They were never sold as big ag monopoly promotion laws. They were sold as you, the consumer, will have informed consent choices over your own food. But because of the interstate commerce clause of the United States Constitution, which Pennsylvania itself, when it tried to regulate food outside the state, went up to the Supreme Court and lost almost a century ago with the Supreme Court saying, no, you can't do that. The Interstate Commerce Clause says commerce between the states cannot be governed by any of the states. It can only be governed by Congress. They have an exclusive control over interstate commerce. Not only is there, that's how it's called the Dormant Commerce Clause, because the active one is Congress has a right to regulate interstate commerce. The implicated inference of that is states do not have the right to govern interstate commerce. There's also other rights implicated. Your right to travel under the Constitution, which is protected. You're, you're right. You're the privileges and immunities clause of the U.S. Constitution, which protected. The fear was in one state would try to compete with the other. One state would try to regulate the other citizens. And they're like, no, 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 you can't do that in commercial transactions or relations. Your power ends at your borders. So that's what we submitted. We said, judge, just make it clear. This only applies to sales within the state of Pennsylvania, like the law says. And Pennsylvania, the, ju and well, the PDA judge freaked out. <laughs> PDA files an opposition. And they say this is outrageous that, in fact, they said, Judge, if, if the only way you could even consider this modification is if you add the language that you're not allowed to possess or purchase or produce food in the state of Pennsylvania, if there's any alleged intent to sell it to people outside the state, to people in foreign countries. The problem is. 
The law says no such thing. It says just the opposite. So the judge got our, our submission, got their submission, came back from vacation, and he rejected every single request the government made, every single one. So the government had all these, say, you know, add this, add this, add this, add this, add this, add this, add this. And the judge was no, 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 no. And what he did is he used our exact language verbatim, which said this injunction only applies to sales within the state of Pennsylvania. That cannot apply for constitutional reasons to sales to people outside the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, and that's and the court necessarily made that decision by rejecting the explicit and express request of the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. So what it does is it opens, it allows Amos to get his products to his members outside the state of Pennsylvania, which is 95% of Amos Miller's membership, which were many of the people who testified in front of the judge that said their physical health was at risk if they didn't have access to his food and particular raw milk products, especially. Now, what does the PDA do? They go around lying to the press saying that, oh, pretending the judge had signed their version of the order when the judge had just rejected their version of the order entirely, saying, oh, well, we can still uh, go after Amos. And in fact, we're hereby declaring that if you possess food inside Pennsylvania's borders that were not permitted by a Pennsylvania permitted producer, we can arrest you and imprison you uh, for not for, for having food, possessing food with the intent to sell. Uh, the if you merely distribute it across their borders, if you merely produce it in Pennsylvania, this would make illegal all kinds of everyday acts. Food is shipped, distributed, transported, produced in that state every single day that's not by a Pennsylvania permitted producer. It would be a disaster for the food economy in Pennsylvania and globally. It would be a complete, as my point to the judge was, they don't want you to just amend the law, judge. They want you to amend the Constitution of the United States. They want you to eviscerate the Interstate Commerce Clause and make the PDA the FDA of the world, the WHO's version of the world. And remember, it's the same Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture that was caught lying in these same Pennsylvania health authorities that were caught lying by base Judge Stickman during the pandemic. That remembers one of their highest ranking Pennsylvania authority is the, is the trans person, doesn't know whether they're a man or a woman, uh, working for the Biden administration. So that's, I mean, that's how corrupt the, these regulators are. And so the uh, the judge explicitly rejected it. Massive win for Amos Miller. Massive win for farmers across the state of Pennsylvania. Massive win potentially for farmers everywhere. They're getting harassed in Oregon as we speak. They're getting harassed in Ohio as we speak. I love Senator J.D. Vance. Time to get involved in big ag, bro. Bro, uh, it's time to speak out. There's Ohio farmers, Ohio people now being targeted. It's a nice size Amish community there. Time to, I mean, you got Benny Moreno elected uh, through the primary. He's going to win. God bless. Now it's time to get on to some of these issues. Some other politicians, too, need to start speaking out. A certain president needs to speak out, a former president of the United States. But the, the, the background of the Amos Miller case is it's, it, it's just an Amish farmer who wants to farm healthy food that people really need. And they're trying to crush him and stop him, not because of safety concerns, because he's one of the safest food producers in the history of the state of Pennsylvania and America, but rather because the Amish way of life presents an exit ramp to ordinary Americans who don't want their diets controlled and dictated by corrupt politicians uh, and regulators and their friends in big agriculture who only want to give us corporatized, industrialized, mechanized food laced with God knows what in today's chemicals, stuck and injected with the latest uh, uh, Frankensteinian concoction from the likes of Pfizer. Uh, that's what the so Amos Miller's case is about food freedom for all Americans. I'm, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture is so corrupt I'm sure they will continue to try to harass and array him, continue to try to illicitly and unlawfully surveil him or search him, continue to try to uh, crush him because it's been their goal and objective. But it's ill-advised because the longer this continues, the more their risk politically and legally runs. Because before this case, no court had established what this court established, which is these state agencies trying to regulate food products that are only being distributed outside of the state are acting illegally under their own state laws and unconstitutionally. They wanted to set a precedent of destroying food freedom by destroying Amos Miller. 
and the food precedent they're going to set is going to set about the destruction of the rogue aspects of the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and the discredited improper Pope of Food, uh, Pope Redding, the Secretary of Agriculture. That's the path they're on. The U.S. Department of Agriculture and the U.S. government recognized that risk and got out of it in the federal case. But the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture is not politically acute, astute enough to recognize that they need to exit quickly before it's the end of their rights. Amos isn't going to sue, but his members can. And as you, if you keep dragging him into court, he's going to get to establish constitutional rights and liberties he wouldn't have otherwise been in a position to do. This is their own foolhardiness, their own eager egos that are just so out of control. And all the lazy politicians in Pennsylvania and the, and the uh, supplicant press in Pennsylvania need to wake up. Why did a judge reject every single request the PDA made? Is PDA deliberately, materially violating constitutional rights and privileges throughout the state by, uh, by um, uh, interpreting and enforcing their laws in a way that directly contradicts what the legislature itself said? It's time for them all to take action. But thanks to Amos Miller's steadfastness, his dedication to truth on a go forward basis, his caring uh, for all of his uh, the members of his uh, private farm, uh, they, their food they now have access to. Uh, that again, snow sales can take place within the state of Pennsylvania, has to be outside the state. Uh, but for all of them, they can get access to uh, his fresh food again. Uh, and I'm sure the harassment will not end. Uh, but I pre, but this is a, one of the biggest wins in food freedom in more than a decade. Uh, one of the biggest in the history of the country has the precedent to be to establish precedent to benefit not only farmers in Pennsylvania, but across the nation. Federal civil rights claims by the members are forthcoming. And I want to thank everybody who helped at 1776lawcenter.com, where you can share the link, share the information. You can get the court documents, read them for yourself. You can get the press reports, including hostile press reports. We put it all up there. You can get links to other interviews and statements and people who watch the actual hearing and proceeding. So uh, at 1776lawcenter.com. And if you want some cool merch, we got that too, uh, uh, to, uh, to help promote the cause. Everybody who helped made a difference. And it's the one of the biggest white pills, uh, I, you know, it, in my legal experience. Well, that, that's the thing. I, I, I don't think I can overestimate it enough for you or overstate it. The victory is massive and monumental. So it, it is a big congratulations, Barnes. And, and may there be more. Touch wood, pupukin and ahor, as we say in both Yiddish and, and Christian. Touch wood means touch the wood of the original cross. And um, I had an Indian daycare teacher who said in, in Indian culture, it's touch gold. So Godspeed, Barnes.